This is Pastor Dean's Sermon Archive. Pastor Dean is author, speaker, and senior pastor at Living Faith Church in Hermiston, Oregon. Today, Pastor Dean shares with us the power of living in the Holy Spirit's anointing in our day-to-day life. As you've listened to today's podcast, we would appreciate it if you would review it as your feedback helps others discover the podcast and find the life and freedom they are searching for in Jesus Christ. Now here's Pastor Dean with today's message. In our darkest moments, God does his greatest works. Everybody say it with me, would you? In the worst times, God does his greatest works. See, we, we often forget that. We often forget that. That it's when we're in the desert that God makes water come out of a rock. That it's when we're in the desert, God gives manna from heaven. That when the giant is out there intimidating everybody and everybody is hunkering down and hiding, here comes David with a slingshot. You come against me with a sword and a spear. I come against you in the name of the Lord. You little runt, what do you think you're doing? Just coming to you in the name of the Lord. Got a rock. Who's our rock? Jesus. I couldn't hear you. Who's our rock? Jesus. I'm sorry. Who's our rock? Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to throw Jesus into this situation. Amen. Come on. See, we're, we, we live in a fallen world. And because we live in a fallen world, man's heart is... Jeremiah said that it is desperately wicked. That the heart of man is desperately wicked. That it's full of deceit. This is, this is amazing. It's full of deceit and desperately wicked. He must have been looking down through time and looking at Washington, D.C., But it's not just Washington, D.C. It's every one of us in this room if we weren't born again. Come on, until we come to Jesus, our heart is full of deceit and it's desperately wicked. And so we live in a fallen world. We live among people that do evil things. We live in a fallen world that has sickness and disease and corruption. And so, yeah, we're going to experience sickness. We're going to experience disease. We're going to face physical adversity. We're going to face people telling lies and, and deceiving. We're going, to, we're going to face employees that say one thing and do another. We're going to, we're going to face neighbors that, that say things and do things. We live in a corrupt, fallen world. Jesus doesn't save us and immediately take us to heaven. Although I'm going to be honest with you, there have been people I've prayed for. Jesus, would you save them and get them to heaven? Because I'm not sure they're going to make it. He didn't do it. You know what he does instead? He saves us and gives us his Holy Spirit. And says, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And then he prays to the Father and he says, keep them while they're in the world. Why does he pray to the Father to keep us while we're in the world? Because we live in a fallen world where there's sickness, where there's disease, where bad things happen even to born again people. Where drunk drivers run into the automobiles of born-again, Holy Ghost-filled, tongue-talking preachers. Like me. On Christmas Eve of 92. (laughs) It happens. Come on, amen? Amen. But what does God promise to us in this situation? Right here, Romans 8, 28, right? 
Everyone's going to read it with me out loud. In fact, I'm going to ask you to stand and read this with me, would you? Everyone out loud? Here we go. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. I don't think it got deep in your heart yet. We've got to read it one more time. Everyone out loud together. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. Come on. Come on. Amen. Come on. You, you know it. This is our mantra. You know it. With God, all things are possible. God lives in me. Therefore, to me, all things work together. All things are possible and all things work together for my good. Amen? Amen. That's who we are. Yes. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's who you are. Believe it. Believe it. Come on. Amen. You may be seated. And so in to this crazy darkness that we're living in. Almighty God says, I want to come and do my greatest work. In fact, I believe with all my heart, right now, God is doing his greatest work. It's just that as we've discovered, the majority don't get it. They don't figure it out. They miss it. And what is sad is, historically, it is a proven fact, historically, that one generation of the church moving into the next generation, that next generation experiences a move of God, and the generation before them don't get it and will actually persecute them. When I came to Jesus and we were in the middle of the Jesus people movement, it was, it was the evangelicals and the Pentecostals that were pointing their finger and saying, that can't be God. They were the same ones who at the turn of the 20th century were experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Azusa Street in the, in the mountains of, of Tennessee and the Carolinas and Georgia and, and so you, you had these, these two waves going, one from the East Coast, one from the West Coast, and, and even, even out of Joplin, Missouri, so even out of the middle of our nation, you had this Pentecostal wave just rising up. But those folks that experienced that by the 1960s, when my generation was experiencing a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it can't be God. Them long-haired, stringy gene, that can't be God. And they would give us a big frown and say, if you really knew God, you would get holy and you would get rid of that long hair and them stringy jeans. <laughs> That's about the way they would look also. <laughs> right in the middle of a great move of God that was going on in a church plant that we, that we did one Sunday night, we had a whole group of people come directly from the beach. They had heard what God was doing. They came directly from the beach. Guess what they were wearing if they came directly from the beach? My whole front row was bikinis. I had to stare at the back wall through the whole sermon. <laughs> Man, did I hear it the next day from our bishop. Just, just chewing me out. I went, Bishop, what, you think I went down there and invited them? Please come in your bikinis. <laughs> they came. Let me tell you what happened at the end of the service. The whole bunch came forward and gave their life to Jesus. Yeah. Come on. I mean, every one of them. And so that Thursday night, I'm, I'm in their home. And they've got their cigarettes and their beer. And we're studying the Bible together, learning how to walk as Jesus wants you to walk. I got in trouble for that. But it's okay. 
Because we were leading them to Jesus. The next Sunday night, they were all there again, down on the front row. But they weren't in bikinis. Hallelujah. But every one of them had a tambourine. Every one of them had a tambourine. It was the noisiest, craziest thing you ever heard. Because they were white folk. They didn't know how to play a tambourine. <laughs> this isn't even exaggerated a little bit. God was moving. I'll tell you what was going on at that time in Canada. The cost of living was going up 25% a quarter. That means in 12 months, everything was doubling in price. We were living in a crazy economic nightmare. But into that darkness, God poured his Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, into this crazy time, God wants to do his greatest work. He's just looking for people that will do it. Look, look at what Jesus said the church was supposed to look like. This is what Jesus said the church was supposed to look like. In Matthew chapter 28, 19, he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The church is afraid to do that right now. We're sheltering in place, and we're afraid to baptize people because we might spread the virus. We're being intimidated and cowering. In Mark 16, 15, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. In my name you shall cast out devils. You shall speak with new tongues. You shall take up serpents that shall not harm you. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But we're not doing that. And the reason we're not doing that is because we are afraid to lay hands on people. We might spread something. Look at the next one. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 20 through 25. And I want to read this to you because rather than quoting it to you, I'd like to read this to you, and I hope you'll follow with me. I said, I think it's supposed to be chapter 12 instead of chapter 10. Let me go there. It's supposed to be um, chapter 10. <laughs> chapter 12 was another point. I'm sorry. Let me get there. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some. But exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now he's saying... When you see the day of Jesus Christ coming, the rapture of the church approaching, be even more diligent about assembling together, gathering together, edifying one another, encouraging one another, strengthening one another. What are we doing? We're sheltering in place. And, and I even hear pastors say this statement. Well, but you know, we can be the church and just and, 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 and gather online. No. Folks, you know, and even if you're having a watch party, you're not together. You're in your own house. We're at home in our pajamas 
listening to some preacher on TV. Folks, but Scripture, when you read Scripture, the only way you can encourage one another and build one another up in love is there's got to be relationship. And relationship cannot happen over the internet the same way it happens in person. Because it's designed that way. The way God created us in our soul person is it happens through relationship one-on-one and in groups. And that is why down through history, when man's governments and when and when when the, the Satan was able to use the systems of man to try and shut the church down, the church would go ahead and meet if they had to meet underground. Maybe they couldn't meet in, in groups of 50, 100, 1,000, 2,000, couldn't have mega church meetings, but they could still meet in smaller groups and they would meet together and they would edify and build one another up and strengthen each other's faith and pray for one another, lay hands on one another and do the ministry. And the church was being the church. And I'm saying to you, in this dark time, God is looking for true disciples of Jesus that will believe what Jesus said. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And we're going to gather as the church and we're going to be the church and we're going to be salt and light. Amen. Amen. Do not let the intimidation and fear-mongering of the press Isolate you into your house. Don't do it. Jesus meant for his church to be his church. And as much as I love the ministry on the web, and we've got folks that are with us on the web right now, I want to tell you, there is nothing like worshiping together. There's nothing like gathering together, being together, and strengthening one another, speaking to one another, building one another up in love. Amen. See, I I believe truly. Let me share this with you. When Wanda and I first went behind the Iron Curtain, One of the things that was startling to us was people walked with their head down. They didn't make eye contact. They didn't speak to one another. They didn't touch one another. They were afraid of their next door neighbor because they were afraid their next door neighbor would turn them in. Because under socialist, communist, Marxist, Leninist structures, They make enemies of their neighbors. They're supposed to report their neighbors. We are doing that in our American culture. This American culture that has been strong because the neighbors always watched for the neighbors. Now, to you that are that are young, you're you're under 40, this is gonna sound very strange to you, okay? But when when I was a kid back in the 50s, and well, even in the late 40s, 50s, and 60s. If we were misbehaving in the neighborhood, the neighbor would grab you by the ear and march you home <laughs> and tell your parents. And if at school... You got in trouble, and you got hacked at school. Anybody remember what hacking is? That meant, now this is really going to sound strange to the young ones. They actually had boards. The ones I always saw were about that long, had a handle, had holes drilled in them. They were about that thick. Okay. Except in PE. My PE teachers would find the largest size tennis shoes you could imagine. One of them had a size 22 tennis shoe. He had hold that puppy by the, by the nose of that tennis shoe and smack you with it and send you into outer space. <laughs> Hacking. But here was the bad part about it. Before you got home, 
they told your parents so then you would get it at home. Okay? Why? Because neighbors watched out for one another. They weren't afraid of one another. They, they watched out for one They encouraged one another. They, stre- they strengthened one another. What I love about my neighborhood, the neighborhood that we've been living in for the last decade, neighbors, we watch out for another. We watch out for each other's house. When, and, and when one's going to be gone on vacation, they let the others know, and they keep a watch out over the house. My one neighbor, they go to, they go to Mexico every year to go back and see family, and we watch their house for a month while they're gone. We watch out for them. Watch out for one another. But, the, but our culture is trying to turn us against one another. And the sad part is, is now the church is pulling back from one another out of fear. We're going to do what Elijah did. I shared with you last week that Elijah, when he was facing a similar time, a pagan culture that was coming after true believers in, with Jezebel, that the first thing he did was he ran to Beersheba. Okay? The place, of, the place of calling, the place of covenant. It was the place where Abraham, after he had offered Isaac on Mount Moriah, went to Beersheba and, and he actually lived there for a season. It's where, it's where Jacob met God face to face. It's, it, and and we, we talked about how that we've got to reaffirm our covenant with Almighty God. I am a born again child of God. I am a new creation. And I, I, that's who I am. That is now my identity. And I got to declare my identity. I am now in Christ. I have been made accepted in the beloved. I am adopted son of God. You're an adopted child of God. Amen? Amen. God, God, before the foundation of the world, he set you that you would be holy without blame before him in a love relationship with almighty God. Jesus Christ has raised you up and made you sit together with him in heavenly places. That's where you're seated right now. Come on, amen? We got to declare that and then we got to trust God's divine provision. He's going to take care of me. He is going to take care of me. I don't have to fear when I go and minister to people. I don't live in fear. I don't, I do not live in fear. I'm not afraid to lay hands on you. Well, what if I give you something? The power of Almighty God is strong enough to kill it. We don't live in fear. We trust God's divine provision. But from Beersheba, he ran, he ran 100 miles from the Jezreel Valley to Beersheba, the most southern city in Judah. But he ran another 200 miles to Mount Sinai, called Mount Horeb also. Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai in Scripture are the same location. And he ran there. Why? He ran there to meet God face to face. He was going to meet God face to face. It's really interesting because when you read about it in 1 Kings 19, it talks about how that the windstorm came so strong, it shook the rocks and stuff where he was at. I mean, God met him in a storm. And Elijah was hunkering down in a cave. But then he heard the soft voice of God. And it drew him. Interesting scripture. This is the one I, I, I went to a moment ago in Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go there this time. Hebrews chapter 12. For you've not come to the mountain that may be be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. 
for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. Where is that place? What mountain is that? That's Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. That's where Elijah ran to. But, it, but for you and I, when we run to our Mount Sinai, we're not running to this Mount Sinai. Where are we running to next? But you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Where is that? That's Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. Today we call it the Temple Mount. The most northern portion of Mount Moriah is also called Golgotha or Calvary. See, we run not to Mount Sinai. We run to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, where Abraham was led by God to take the son that he loved, the son of covenant, the son of promise. And he took him to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. But God provided a ram in place of the sacrifice of his son, why? Because Almighty God, just a few hundred years later, was going to send the Son of His love, His Son of promise. He was going to send His covenant Son to earth, and He would go to that same Mount Moriah. But instead of providing a ram in His place, he would be sacrificed. He would sacrifice himself so that you and I would not have to be sacrificed. But you and I, who were aliens to God and enemies of God, we could become sons and daughters of God. Amen. And so we can run to Mount Zion. We can run to Mount Moriah. We can run to Calvary and there we can be washed. We can be cleansed. We can experience new creation. We can be born again. And we can receive the Spirit of God. And we can receive the Spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We can receive the Holy Spirit into our life. We can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We can be adopted sons and daughters of Almighty God. Walking in that new identity. Walking in that covenant relationship with Almighty God. We can run to Mount Moriah. And in our darkest moments, that's where we run. And when the spirit of fear comes on us and tries to plague us, we have to hear the same thing the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. See, Timothy was going through a really dark season, a season of great persecution. And Timothy was getting afraid. He was thinking about stopping the ministry. He was thinking about hunkering down and hiding, just like some of you. Some of you that are listening to me on the web right now, you have been hunkering down. You have been sheltering in place. And some of you maybe haven't even gone out of your house in days. And you're, you're living in that fear. And Almighty God says to you what, exactly what Paul wrote to Timothy. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I say to you, run to Mount Moriah. Reaffirm your place with Almighty God, your covenant with Almighty God. Reaffirm, declare who you are in Christ. Rise up. Let the Holy Spirit fill you afresh with the boldness and the courage and the faith of Almighty God that as a son and daughter of God, you do not live in fear. <laughs> Would you lift your hands with me and just worship him? Just worship him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, almighty God. 
Praise you, Almighty God. Hallelujah. 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 Mm. When we get to Mount Moriah, when we get to Mount Zion, what do we do? We present ourselves to him a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Why do we do that? For the same reason Jesus said, would you read it with me? Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? We present our bodies a living sacrifice to Almighty God. We take up our cross to follow Jesus. It is a dying to self. When Elijah got there, God tested his true motive. What are you doing here? Three times God asked him, what are you doing here? And he said the same thing. I'm zealous for God. And the people have broken covenant with you. And I'm the only one left. His eyes were totally on himself. And, that, and that's what the spirit of fear does. We get focused on ourselves. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid of something evil happening to us. Because our focus is on ourself. Instead of our eyes being on Jesus... And all of his provision for us, our eyes are on ourself. We're living in fear. We have, to get to, we have to get to Mount Moriah and kneel before Jesus and present ourselves to him a living sacrifice and just die to self. So what if I die? You know, you know what's, what's, really, what's really been a startling reality to me through this whole thing, and I, I share this with you listening around the world. We in America are cowering in fear of a virus and governors who are violating the Constitution. For the first time in the 224 years of this nation, we have made our Constitution subservient to another authority. And that should never happen. But we're cowering in fear. And that's made me ask multiple times, if we cower in fear of this what in the world would we do if we were in Iran or North Africa or China? What would we do? Would we have the courage and the spiritual strength and the faith to serve God in the face of that kind of threat? I'm going to be candid with you. For the majority of the Christian church in USA, no. We would find a reason to excuse ourselves. Now I want to tell you, this is time where the church has to get back to Mount Moriah, get on our face and present ourselves a living sacrifice to God and say, God... I'm going to serve you and I'm going to and I'm going to be the church no matter what 
the government says. I am first and foremost a child of the kingdom of Almighty God, and you command us to not forsake the assembling. I will not forsake the assembling. You command me that I am supposed to go into all the world and share the gospel. I'm going to share the gospel. You command me that I'm supposed to go in your name, and I am supposed to cast out demons. I am supposed to lay hands on the sick, and they recover. I am supposed to baptize believers. I am going to be the church because Jesus you are my Lord and my Savior and I will have no other king but you Jesus Amen. and you know what comes out of this I let me look oh cool I got another two hours <laughs> the, here's the awesome thing in Acts chapter 4 you know what's happened I've shared it with you before the apostle Peter and the apostle John have been arrested for preaching in the name of Jesus they've threatened them they've told them you stop this you don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus and what happens in Acts chapter 4 is Peter and John, they go back to the church and they, they gather the church around them and they sit down and they go, you're not going to believe this, guys. We can't, we can't do this anymore. And wisdom is that we don't assemble anymore. And, 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 and wisdom is that you, you just go to your home and, and you read the scrolls How many know that's not what the Bible says? No. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that. It said they got together and they prayed, and this was their prayer. Jesus, make us bold to preach in your name and stretch your hand through us and do miracles and signs and wonders. And in verse 31, it says that they were so bold and so powerful, the city became afraid of them. And then in chapter 5, the middle of chapter 5, beginning in verse 14, 16, it says that they were doing such mighty works that the church was growing exponentially because of the work of the church. The church was being the church even though they were commanded not to. Yeah. Now here's what's really fun. So what happens? The leaders hear about it. And they rearrest Peter and some of the other apostles and they bring them in and they, they put them in jail to hold a hearing the next day. Angel comes and lets them out of jail and tells them, go preach at the temple. They go to the temple. They, they come right out of jail for preaching and go right to the temple and start preaching. And the next morning when they meet to have this hearing, they say, go bring them in. They go to get them. The jail's empty. They come back and they go, they're not there. The jail is empty. And someone stands up and says, I just saw them. They're at the temple preaching in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know where I'm going. I'm going to tell you right now, for myself, Pastor Reagan, Pastor Jesse, Pastor Wanda, we're not backing up. We're going to take the gospel. Right. Folks, listen, we've got a county, a city to win for Jesus and a county to reach out to. Come on. Amen. We have got to reach Greater Hermiston. We have got to reach from Echo to Boardman. We've got to reach them with the gospel. But that's not enough. We've got to reach beyond that. We've got to reach beyond that. We have got to reach as many people as we can with the gospel right now, right now. Jesus is doing his greatest work right now. Right now. And that's what happened. Elijah left his meeting with Almighty God on Mount Sinai and went and did his greatest work. And one of the greatest works he did was he went to Abel Mahola, the Valley of Dancing, and he met 
a young man named Elijah. And he called Elijah to become his mentee. And Elijah was a mentor to Elisha. And Elisha and Elijah went forth doing the work. Elisha was his servant, was being trained under him because the day was going to come when they were going to go across the River Jordan. And as Elijah went, because his work was done, Elisha would ask him. He, he would turn to him and say, what do you want? How come you keep following me? I want a double portion of what you had. I want to do twice as much work as what you've done. And Almighty God, when he took Elijah to heaven, let the anointing fall on Elisha. And Elisha did twice as much as what Elijah did. But the reason that was able to happen was because Elijah went to Mount Sinai. He met God face to face. And encountering God face to face, he walked away from there with a greater anointing. Because he went deeper with God than he had ever gone in his life. And as I was praying about this this morning, in my mind's eye, I saw every one of the young men and women that are here today. I didn't know you would be here, Omar and Angie, but I saw your face. I saw your face, Talia. I saw you. I saw Drex and Audrey. I saw you, Stephen. I saw that, that whole group right there. I saw them. I saw you, Melissa. I saw you. Here's what I saw. I saw the next generation rising up with a greater anointing and a greater power than mom and dad and grandma and grandpa ever had in their life. Rising up with a greater anointing. And the reason was because we boldly and courageously went forth as the church that Jesus Christ has built on earth. Yes. Instead of cowering in the face of this fear mongering, the intimidation that's going on right now, we boldly rise up and go forth with a greater anointing than we've ever had. And the generation after us does a greater work than we've ever dreamed. Yeah. I didn't miss the front row, by the way. Just wanted you to know I saw you too. I'm not kidding. I saw that in my mind's eye. I believe... The greatest responsibility God's given me at this time in my life is to raise up the next generation knowing how to walk in the Holy Ghost power and anointing. I mean, with a greater anointing and not be afraid. Don't fear. Don't fear. Going to be criticized? Yeah. Going to face persecution? Yep. Going to be outcast? Yeah. You can't fear that stuff. You can't fear. So I want us to have a Mount Zion experience today. Thank you for listening to Pastor Dean's Sermon Archive. If his message today encouraged you, please consider leaving a review or comment on his blog to let us know. You can find Pastor Dean's blog at fdeanhackett.com. Thank you again for listening.